Friday morning, Ramon, Kayla, and Will is brewed by 8th and Roast on 104.5 The Zone with Ramon Foster. I'm Will Bowling. Kayla Anderson with the morning off. Robert Walsh making the show happen as always, as we are joined now, as we always are, Fridays at 720 by our good friend Brent Hubs of AllQuest and on three. What's up, Brent? How are you? I'm doing great. Hope you guys are doing well on this Friday. Happy Easter, everybody. Yes, sir. Same you as well. You, sir. Uh, I'm a little upset, Brent, that I'm going to be in Knoxville broadcasting Tennessee Georgia baseball tonight. And I, I told, uh, you know, some of the other reporters in Knoxville, they're all just uh, avoiding me. They're ghosting me by going to Detroit. There's, there's, I don't know what there is to do in Detroit tonight, but no one's going to be around in Knoxville this weekend. Shame. Well, the good news is you'll be able to finish that baseball game. We'll get you something to eat, take a quick nap. Um, <laughs> and uh, then get yourself ready for a b- basketball game that'll start sometime, right? Some, yeah. Sometime 14 hours from now, we'll be playing basketball. Yeah, that's right. And especially the fact that Zach Eady and the 70 fouls that will be called every time somebody <laughs> breathes on him are playing before Tennessee and Detroit. It might be a while, won't it, Brent? Yeah, it, 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 could, be, it could be a 1030 Eastern start before Oof. it's all said and done instead of 950. But, but here's hoping. Long day for those guys to lay around. It is tough, but um, it's, it's TV. It's the way it goes. They're not the only ones to play a late game. You got to get your mind right, get yourself ready to play at a heck of a challenge against Creighton tonight. Uh, and then as we saw last night, uh, when the, when the upper seeds advance, um, and there's not, you know, a bunch of 11s hanging around or, or a real s- couple of true Cinderella stories. When you get into the sweet 16, you got a lot of pick em games and, and we saw some pick em games last night and, uh, some really close basketball games. So, you know, this one's going to be tough tonight. So Brent Creighton shot more threes than anyone in the sec, uh, this season outside of Alabama. How much does Tennessee, you feel like, like this matchup against the blue Jays tonight? Well, I mean, it's, ch- it's a challenge, but I mean, I don't think that they're, I mean, they, they've seen a team that shoots the three that lives by the three Creighton plays the analytics game. They play a lot like Alabama from a shot selection standpoint, they don't play as fast, although they do want to play up and down the floor, uh, but not hardly as fast as Alabama. And uh, I mean, I think Tennessee's okay with the matchup. They know they've got to go out, um, guard this team for 40 minutes. You can't take a, you know, you can't take a, a, a lull. You, you, you know, you can't take a three or four minute period where you don't play very well defensively. Cause if you do, they'll run, you know, they'll run 12 Oh on you in a, in a hurry. And then the flip side of it, we saw it last night. You got to make some shots, right? I mean, Arizona, I mean, look, I'm not taking anything away from Clemson. Clemson won that game last night, but Arizona had a bunch of open looks they couldn't make. Uh, and then North Carolina couldn't make a shot in the second half when they had to have one. And then they took a horrible, horrible three-point shot late in that game, uh, which was just a poor shot, shot selection. So it comes down to, you know, when you're playing a high-profile offense, you know, you're going to have to make some some shots because I, I don't think this game is going to be played in the 60s tonight. So Tennessee's offense is going to have to complement their defense tonight really well. When it comes down to the offense complementing the defense, Santiago Vescovi is a guy that's been reported as under the weather. Will he have a flu game tonight to where he goes off like Jordan or what do we expect from him? Uh, you know, we'll see how much he plays. Um, I, you know, I don't think that at this point in the season – Given what he's done all year long, you go into into this game expecting him to to get off flu or flu or not flu or ill or not ill. I don't think you get you know go in with a high expectation or a real expectation that he's going to suddenly get off the deck offensively. I mean, he's just not been a real factor offensively. I think the question is, you know, what do they get out of uh, Josiah Jordan James? Um, who's who is the fourth player to complement the big three now? Jonas adu has got to show up. He can't miss layups, particularly early in the game. I mean, they're going to try to play through him as they have all year long. He's got to have one of those games where he gets off to a good start, and, and he just can't, you know, sort of pitch it at the rim or shove it at the rim. I mean, he's going to have to score the basketball, make layups, dunk the ball with the opportunities there to dunk the ball. Uh, he's going to have to play well. Then, obviously, they got to get Connect and Ziegler going. I mean, that's their big three when – when that big three combines for 50 points or more, I think Tennessee's lost two games this year. Um, now, you need somebody to go with them. You would like a fourth. Uh, and that was the advantage to beating Texas is they got double digit, double digits out of Awaka and double digits out of uh, you know Josiah Jordan-James. Tennessee's not going to win this game tonight if their big three doesn't show up offensively. I mean, I, I just think those guys are going to have to carry this team offensively and going to have to put the ball in the basket because you got to score. No doubt about it. Um, 
switching over to the uh, football side of things, Hubs, what what has been a trend so far as far as the practices that have been laid out in pads? You know, it's a difference between uh, sure. <laughs> the pad, padded practice versus the others. And they also just logged a uh, scrimmage last weekend yeah, also. Yeah, I've spoken like a man who understands the notion that football's played in pads. The rest of it's seven on seven football, right? <laughs> yeah, ex- so, exactly. Um, which <laughs> which they've made a bigger thing these days. Okay, seven on seven is crushing it. Okay, but not the football that we know, Hubs. Not the football that the offensive lineman knows, right, Ramon? <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that you know, from a physicality standpoint, a couple of quick takeaways. One. I think they're going to be just fine with Lance Hurd at left tackle. Um, he's still got some things to learn, but, man, he's big. He's athletic. He's got everything you want as a tackle. I think he's adjusting and settling in pretty well. He's not been perfect because he's had James Pierce a few times, and James Pierce has got his share of wins for sure against Lance Hurd. But I think Lance Hurd is going to be just fine at left tackle. I think you feel better about it. You felt good about that with going into spring. You feel better about it two weeks into spring. Uh, and then on the defensive line, they got a bunch of grown men. Um, I mean, a bunch of grown men playing on the defensive line. That can go, um, you know, 14 deep if they want to. Um, they're really, really deep there. So that's impressive. Uh, and then, you know, I think the other thing is you're hearing talk of the, the transfers, which you would expect, right? If you're going to go in the portal and you're going to land guys, you, you want guys that, that can help you immediately because that's why you took them. Uh, so you're you're hearing names like Jacoby Thomas at safety, in, in what he's able to do and, and how he's played. Jerome McCoy at corner uh, has done some good things. Maybe the guy nobody's talked about going into spring practice that as pads have gotten on has probably showed up shown up more uh, is, is Miles Ketzelman, the the tight end transfer from Alabama, kind of the forgotten guy. Everybody talks about holding stage from Notre Dame. Uh, but but I think I think Ketzelman is a guy who's going to factor in at the tight end position and can help them because he's been physical. And then I think Chris Brazel had his best week this week. Uh, he's starting to settle in as well, and that's what you expect out of those transfers because you didn't bring them in to watch. Uh, but but I think they've you know had a, a solid start. I mean, th- this is a you know there's a lot of good vibes about this team right now. They're a long way to go. They've got a lot of things they need to work on. But there's a lot of places that you feel good about where this football team is right now. With the addition of these newcomers, offensively and defensively, how have you seen them deal with the pace of the offense? Do you see them, you know, deer in the headlights a little bit? And has the pace somewhat kept up with Nico at quarterback also since he's new? Well, the the pace is there uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I mean, Nico's been in this system for over a year now. Uh, and, And I think, listen, we hear this all the time. I don't care what level of football you're at. You hear this all the time. You hear the backup saying, well, I prepared like a starter every day. I prepared like a starter every day. The reality is you didn't prepare like a starter every day because you knew you weren't a starter. You prepared well. I'm not saying you didn't prepare well, but you knew you wasn't going to play unless there was an injury. So, yeah, you were ready, but it was different. I don't care. It's human nature. Your preparation is a little bit different. Nico's preparation since the 1st of December uh, when it appeared Joe might not might not play in the bowl game, and then ultimately he didn't. Nico's had a different gear since that that first part of December. He knew at the end of the regular season, hey, it's my time. Whether I start the bowl game or don't start the bowl game, I'm on the clock now because I'm the starter. That it's time to go. And, and I think his prep has been different. And as a result of that, Ramon, I think he's playing faster. In in helmet communication probably helps a little bit with with a young quarterback knowing where to go with the ball and that type of thing. They're adjusting to that. I think the pace has been fine. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, you're seeing some of those newcomers on defense adjusting to the pace uh, and, and herds adjusted, having to adjust to it a little bit. But I don't think it's been an, an issue. Uh, I, I think those guys have done a good job. Remember this, too. When you played back in, in February before spring practice, you couldn't do a ton of football things, right? I mean, there were some limitations. You guys were just lifting and, you know, now they can do all the walkthrough stuff they want to in February. Um, and a walkthrough can be a run-through basically without a football. So they, they do a lot of stuff in the month of February to work on that pace so that you don't lose a week of, of spring practice with everybody trying to get acclimated to what you're doing. That's different with pads because you don't have those on in February. But at least from a mental standpoint, you understand the pacing of it because you can kind of you can kind of prep for practice in February the way you couldn't years ago. 
FallQuest Brent Hubs, our guest on Twitter at Brent underscore Hubs here on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. Brent, when you look at the multi-time transfer rule and the way that could change things after spring practices around the country, how settled do you think this Tennessee roster is as far as outgoings and incoming guys and just it, how unprecedented is this era we're about to enter after spring ball where a lot of guys are going to look around and say, I'm a little more buried on the spring depth chart than maybe I thought I was. Well, I'm going to be fascinated to see. We, we've heard the last couple of years about how how chaotic and wild it's going to be at the end of spring practice. and It's just not – it's kind of not materialized to be as wild as everybody predicted it to be. Maybe this is the year that it goes crazy, and, and it's really chaotic, and it's really wild. I'll say this. Since the inception of the transfer portal, we have had at VolQuest, we've had more stories written in admin to run about guys leaving that never ran than we have written and we have published transfer stories hmm. because a lot of those rumors just never materialize. A lot of, a lot of kids, a lot of people's kids, families talk about, I'm out of here, I'm leaving. And then they start to investigate and maybe the grass isn't greener on the other side. Um, I think you've got some guys around the country who left in January that are at places where it's not, it's not as, as great as they thought it was going to be. Some of, some people around the country have called their old school and said, hey, can I come back? Not just Caden Proctor, but some other people around the country have done that as well. So we'll see how chaotic it gets. Um, remember this, too. You cannot go SEC to SEC in the spring. So how much does that limit somebody leaving? Now, all eyes are on Florida. What, what are they going to do at Florida? Are a bunch of guys going to bolt there? Are you more likely to leave if you're at a place where you come out of spring practice and go, man, we're not going to be very good and coach isn't going to make it. I'm going to go ahead and find me another place and get out of here. Um, so there's some different variables we're going to keep an eye on. Uh, but I, I got I to gotta see it a little bit before I totally buy into the thought that this is just going to be the most chaotic spring transfer portal window we've ever seen. Because a lot of these rumors through the last couple of years have not come to fruition. Hubs is is with with that being said, as far as the spring goes, do you have to treat this like the NFL free agency? To whereas if you don't get in on the first two weeks of free agency, the money's dried up as far as NIL because that's that can be one of the main reasons why guys are leaving with playing playing time on the table too. Well, I, I think unlike the NFL free agency, guys guys who are going to leave have an idea where they're going right now, um, but because there's there's tampering if you want to call it that. I mean there's there's a lot of third-party stuff going on right now from a conversation standpoint. So I, I think that instead of waiting until the window opens and, hey, let's see what's available to me, guys already have a really good idea of what's going to be available to them or what's not going to be available to them out there. Now, to go back to Will's question about how stable is Tennessee's roster, you know, I, I mean, I think there's certainly a chance that some guys could leave. We'll, we'll, we'll see. I'm not going to mention any names, but there's some real competition at some positions where – you know, newcomers have come in and enhanced that competition, right? I mean, you look at wide receiver, you're talking about Mike Matthews, who, who's come in and drawn praise the first two weeks. Chris Brazel, I mentioned as well. You know, that's a position that's suddenly deeper now. You know, Braylon Staley, throw him in there as well. It's deeper now than it was back in, in December or November. So we'll see what that position looks like moving forward. In terms of whether or not Tennessee will do anything in the portal, I think you're always looking at what's you know, best available because there's a guy out there that could really enhance your football team. And then specifically, I think Tennessee's got to make a decision here in the next two weeks on running back. Do we feel like we need another running back is what Josh Heupel and his staff have to ask themselves coming out of spring. With Cam Seldon going to miss the first part of, uh, next, of this upcoming season as he recovers from shoulder surgery, are you okay with what you have on your roster? Remember Peyton Lewis, the highly acclaimed newcomer, is not going through spring because he's recovering from surgery he had back in January. So are, are you okay there, or do you feel like you need a veteran to kind of help you get through the first part of the season until Cam Seldon is back? Or do you feel comfortable with Dylan Sampson and then Deshaun Bishop and uh, Khalif Keith to, to, to be your backup running backs? Because that's kind of where you would be. That's a decision Josh Heupel and this offensive staff will have to make here in the next two weeks. Brent, yesterday, Tennessee gets a big commitment from Nashville native Ethan Utley, product of Ensworth on the defensive line. Um, how did Tennessee ultimately 
out recruit Texas, uh, the others that were in the mix for him, and what is Tennessee getting at him? Well, I think Tennessee's getting a really smart player, um, a guy who's uh, who's got a huge upside, and, and I think a guy who is figuring out that the, the depth of the game, and it's not just Friday night. I think that you you know you start you hear him talk, and you know he's starting to fall in love with film study and and the work that he's putting in. I, I think he's starting to grasp the the level of commitment you have to make day in and day out. And I think that's why there's a chance Ethan Utley could make a really nice jump between last year and this year. Not that he was a bad player last year, but Ramon, I think you would agree there's another level for him there. And I think it that is. he is he, – he's starting to understand the, the commitment that is involved in getting to that level, both mentally and physically. I love his upside. How did they get him? Longstanding – the family has a longstanding relationship with Rodney Garner. I think that's really important, and I think you got peer recruiting going on. Uh, Tennessee commitment Dylan Lewis has been working him like crazy. George McIntyre been working him hard. Um, you know, I think that some current players who have known Ethan for the last couple of years have been working him hard. So I think there was a comfort level there with the relationships that he had built with Tennessee. Texas was. I think a month ago, Texas felt like they were in in the lead and, and in a good spot there. But I think ultimately uh, it got back to Ethan Utley being most comfortable at Tennessee with, with his coaches and, and with some players either that's going to be in his class or some current players on the team right now. That's one of the things I, I said to him as far as like – progressing to get better and that goes to almost any high prospect these days oh, yeah. right hubs Absolutely. like yes, what sir. whatever they think you are be that if you are that four star show up each and every game day and let them know i'm a whole lot better than you because of the ratings say so and because of my play say so and that's what i'm hoping he sees along with george and everybody else that's committed uh at that play high school ball hubs yeah i mean there's no doubt i mean and look it's easy right you, you get early offers you know, and, and, and you're probably not mature. You're probably not really ready for it. It's not a maturity thing. It's just, you know, all of a sudden, bam, you know, first day people will start contacting you. You look up, you got a, you know, you got a dozen offers, right. Yeah. From, from big time schools. Now, are they all takes? Could, could you commit right then? I mean, that's all debatable, but when you get those, it's very easy to go, man, I've made it. Uh, you know, I'm good. And I don't think Ethan is, I, I don't want anybody out there listening that to say I'm suggesting He's been lazy or he's been – there's not, there's nothing like that at all. But to maximize his skill and his ability, there's another gear. And I think Ethan Utley is finding that gear. And, and he is – he's not the only one like that, right? I mean, it, it's just – you look at the Ross kid a year ago from Alabama. Look at the gear he found between his junior and senior year of high school. Hey, Hubs, I, I, mean, I, that, I, I mean, that guy was a total different player his senior year of high school. He was a – he was a solid player as a junior, right? Good player. He went from a good player to a guy that people think can come in and make an impact as a freshman because he, he, it, it all clicked for him. He, he put in all the work mentally and physically to put himself in a different place as an athlete. I myself had to fi figure that out, too. I was playing football nice. And I had I had a geometry teacher tick me off one time, and I found that switch. <laughs> I found that switch, Hubs. Like, legitimately, I had to learn how to be a a-hole. I did. Mm -hmm. And from that moment right there, when I crossed those white lines, it was, hey, screw you and whatever you stand for. I'm coming to rip your face off. Well, it, I mean, it, here's the thing. I mean, for a lot of guys, you go through playing – you know, middle school level ball, high school level ball your first few years, or even four years in high school, you are either the fastest, right? Yeah. You, you know, you are the, the most athletic, or you are the biggest, you know, where you can literally just kind of shove the guy around. Then all of a sudden, you got to flip a switch at some point because you, you, you line up across from a guy who's as big as you. Who's as physical as you, right? Who, who can who can hold his own? You can't do. You don't just push him down and go on to the next guy. I mean, like it's it's a battle deal, and and, and that's going to happen. It's big boy ball, and it it changes. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of guys, when does that level come? For some guys, that level may not come until they're in college, you know, or even later. I mean, I I love what Rodney Garner had to say about Byron Young this this past weekend when he met with the media. And he's like, Byron Young did a nice job. He had some sacks. He goes, I watched him play football. He got bullied in the run game. 
because it's big boy ball up there. <laughs> it's different at that level. That moment happens at different times for people, right? I mean, look, Reggie Bush was a dominant player at USC, okay? He got to the NFL, good player, right? Mm-hmm. But, I mean, like, he wasn't dominant because – he had to change and, and go because he was going against athletes that could play with him where early in his, at times in his career at USC, he was just so much better on, on the field than everybody else. It didn't really matter. It, it happens at different points. And I think for Ethan Utley um, and, and other players around there, most of the time it happens in high school. When that switch flips, there's a whole different level that they probably didn't even know existed for them. And I think Ethan Utley started to figure that out, along with a lot of other guys in his situation around the country. Paul Quest, Brent Hubs, always on a high level with us here on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. (laughs) Brent, we appreciate the time as always. Thank you. All right, guys, I got to get my nap. We got a long ways to go. Yes, sir. (laughs) Hey, and go balls. I love it. There's there's Brent Hubs with us this morning. Uh, (laughs) Let's react to some of that coming up. Plus, Bill Simmons said something very dumb yesterday about gambling and sports. We'll talk about it next. If, if you're thinking about purchasing a new Ford truck, the time is now at Two Rivers Ford because it's truck month. They've got financing rates as low as 1.9%, no payments for 90 days, and bonus cash offers. And this is all on top of Two Rivers Ford low prices because they always sell below MSRP. In fact, way below MSRP. But the best part about truck month is that there is no pressure to buy because Two Rivers Ford has a non-commissioned sales team. Yes, you, if you're just interested in test driving, no, not just ready to purchase, it's no problem. You can even call them and schedule a test drive at home. Whatever makes it easiest for you. There's a reason Two Rivers 4 has been the, a landmark local business in our community for over 40 years and a reason they've, they're one of the top Ford dealers in the nation. Two Rivers 4, the South's most trusted Ford dealer.
Friday morning, on your bone, Kayla and Will stay and fly for four hours at a time on RKW. Put up by 8th and Rose, Tramone Foster, Robert Walsh, Will Bowling with you. Kayla Anderson has the morning off. Coming up in 10 minutes, there's something Brent Hubb said that I think is a change coming to college sports that we are going to see explode in about a month. We'll talk about that coming up at 8 o'clock. Mike Golick Jr. will still join us at 920 this morning. Oh, yeah. Interesting stuff yesterday, guys, from Bill Simmons, who thinks that there is not a gambling issue in sports right now. So obviously Shohei Otani is the most recent gambling scandal in sports. And John T. Porter, an NBA player who um, <laughs> might just never play in the NBA again, um, has been accused of gambling on himself, essentially. Uh, betting your own unders, which is just a phenomenally hilarious thing in so many ways. Like, there's video of him making a three and getting upset with himself. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes, there is. It's there also is. tough because the Raptors are tanking right now. If yeah. they finish uh, better than sixth place, their first-round pick goes to the Spurs. So they are actively trying to be bad. So this guy thought that, hey, I can, I can just – Shoot one three, catch three rebounds, and oh, my eye hurts. I can't play anymore. I have a corneal ablation. And he just leaves the game. Michael Porter Jr.'s brother. Yeah. That voice. That was awesome voice by you, by the way, Bert. You like my kid voice? I this like is my kid. eyeball hurting. I can't play in the NBA anymore. <laughs> Evil <Well>. again. <laughs> <laughs> that is one thing. Real quick, though, scratching your cornea, I don't recommend it. Do not recommend it. It's very painful. It's terrible. I did that on a shift working at Dick's Sporting Goods once. Mm, you just wake up and it's, it's just not like, fun. what is wrong on my face? Uh, yeah. But Bill Simmons on the Bill Simmons podcast said uh, this week, he said, I've been talking about gambling on all platforms since I was at ESPN in 2001. We've always had gambling scandals. And then had a laundry list over the last 70 years of gambling scandals. In the 50s, college hoops. In the 60s, Paul Hornick. In the 70s, Boston College basketball. In the 80s, Tulane basketball. You had, obviously, Pete Rose. You had all these things that have happened. Tim Donaghy, the NBA ref, who was jailed uh, for some of the things that he was up to. I don't think that's the same thing as essentially every sport having some iteration of a gambling scandal within the past year. So I'll ask the question to you, Ramon Foster and Robert Walsh. Does sports have a gambling problem right now? No, it's just more accessible and people have the ability to do it. I think it's been, I know it's been there. Okay. It is, it's been around. Uh, what do we, and here's the thing about it. It's more legal gambling. I think that's the issue as opposed to what's been going on in the locker room. You know how many times you see dice or cards, you know what a lot of people learn card games at? Right. I, I do think that's different, though. But well, what I'm saying is that aspect of it has been there, and coaches and general managers and personnel watch that go on. So, of course, when it becomes legal in Connecticut, it becomes legal in Tennessee, it becomes legal in Kansas City or New York, the players are going to do these same similar things. The problem has been it's always been there. It's honestly a part of the culture. It's just now legal. It's the same way you go to a CBD shop and you see a suburban house mom pull up. He's like, oh, I didn't know you were going there. Well, guess what? It's legal to do certain things now. And if the issue is, is betting on yourself or something like that. Like, right. it's just more available now and above board. It's always been a problem. People always have their vices. I think the big bombshell hasn't fallen yet in sports. You think there's something bigger? Because say? I think eventually you're going to have – someone do what John T. Porter is doing, who's really good. John T. Porter is not really good. The Shohei Otani scandal might end up being the one. If there is any evidence that he and his translator were complicit in betting the four and a half million dollars that was placed in, and in California, it's not legal. And obviously baseball rules with that and major league baseball is different from NFL rules about gambling, but. I think it is a fair point that you make that perhaps these issues have always been happening, but now it's easier to track because in order to gamble, you've got social security number, you've got geo tracking apps that know exactly where you are when you place a bet. It, that's an interesting perspective on it. I'd not considered. They got him on Tennessee. Who the hell is betting on Jante? 
Like, you well, know, I know. That? yeah. If, if you're uh, betting on John Tay Porter unders, uh, if you or somebody who has a gambling problem, <laughs> call the Tennessee Red Line at 1 9789. Sounds like he's going to be hitting unders the rest of his career. You are going straight to a watch list if you are betting on John Tay Porter player props in the NBA. You are the example. <laughs> you are the example. Honestly. Yeah. 615 737 1045 is the number. Halftime of the show on a Friday morning. Coming up, how do we view the SEC as a conference in hoops after Alabama's win last night with Tennessee, a chance to make it two teams in the Elite Eight? We'll talk about that. We'll also listen to what Brent Hubbs had to say about something I think is going to explode in college sports this offseason. Coming up next. At Ramon Foster for Secure Lawn, man. It's getting warm outside this weekend. I think we're supposed to tap into the 80s. Okay, and everybody's going to be cutting their grass. Some of y'all going to be cutting your grass, and guess what? You're going to see weeds and all those other invasive things that needed to be out by now. I'm here to tell you whether you live in Williamson County or you live in Sumner, if you live in Wilson, Davis, it doesn't matter, okay? They will come to you and service your yard. They have an interactive website where you can book a uh, an appointment online and get an estimate or if you need somebody from secure lawn to come out and survey your grass and see what issues that you have and fix it make it greener lush and one of the best yards in the neighborhood reach out to the people that i trust man i'm gonna give you the number now i'm gonna give it to you in a second also 615-893-8455 best part about them is everything about secure lawn uh, that they have in front of you, no contracts. If you like them, you keep them. If you don't, you end it. It's just that simple. They're not some big national chain. They're local and have been here for over 20 years in Middle Tennessee. They're very punctual, okay? So as the weather starts to change, get Secure Lawn over to your house to spray some of their awesome sauce on your lawn to kill some of those pesky weeds. You can call them. Again, it's 615-893-8455 or go to their website at securelawn.com.
What's going on, Nashville? Good morning. Happy Friday. 801 from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. I am Robert Walsh. Only one higher-seeded team was victorious last night. Let's check the scores as Clemson took down Arizona 77-72. UConn over San Diego State 82-52. Alabama beats UNC 89-87. And Illinois sends Iowa State home 72-69. Games start today with NC State Marquette. NC State, the lowest-seeded team left in the tournament. That game starts at 6-10 right here on 104.5 The Zone. Opening day yesterday, but not for Braves fans. That happens today as they take on the Phillies at 2.05. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and the Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Second half of the show, 8 a.m. in Nashville as we roll along on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. RKW is brewed by 8th Roast. Robert Walsh makes the show happen. He's our 11-year NFL veteran and Vol for life, the pride of Ripley TN. (laughs) Ramon Foster, I'm Will Bowling. Kayla Anderson with the morning off today. 615-737-1045 is how you jump in. We'll take everything we've learned about Tennessee and Creighton and give you some keys to a Tennessee win tonight. Coming up in 15 minutes, take a look around the Sweet 16 as the last four games of the Sweet 16 take place tonight, including Tennessee late, late, late tonight. I would imagine around 9.30. Take a nap. Essentially what you tell yourself. Uh, Take a nap, rest up, find some downtime, because, yeah, 9 o'clock tip-off Central. That's wild right there, man. I would guess it's probably going to be a half hour later than that as well. Like That's a real thing with Purdue. Mm-hmm. That sucks for us. Of course, Westwood One's coverage here on the zone of the Men's Suite 16 and Elite 8 is brought to you by Old South Properties and Farm Bureau Health Plans. Vol Network coverage as well after Westwood One coverage of the NCAA tournament. So stay tuned for that tonight. Brent Hubs is on with us in the last hour. VolQuest and On3 Rider covering Tennessee Athletics, who also has a good read on the pulse of SEC sports. And I think in a way, Ramon Foster, we might see an unprecedented amount of change in the transfer portal this spring because the multi-time transfer rule is now a thing for the first time for a full spring and a full summer. This is what Brent Hubs had to say on that topic this morning. Well, I'm going to be fascinated to see. We, we've heard the last couple of years about how how chaotic and wild it's going to be at the end of spring practice, and it's just not. It's kind of not materialized to be as wild as everybody predicted it to be. Maybe this is the year that it goes crazy, and, and it's really chaotic and it's really wild. I'll say this: since the inception of the transfer portal, we have had at VolQuest, we've had more stories written. In, in admin to run about guys leaving that never ran than we have written and we have published transfer stories hmm. because a lot of those rumors just never materialize. A lot of, a lot of kids, a lot of people's kids, families talk about, I'm out of here, I'm leaving. And then they start to investigate and maybe the grass isn't greener on the other side. Um, I think you've got some guys around the country who left in January that are at places where it's not, it's not as, as great as they thought it was going to be. Some of, some people around the country have called their old school and said, hey, can I come back? Not just Caden Proctor, but some other people around the country have done that as well. So we'll see how chaotic it gets. Um, remember this, too. You cannot go SEC to SEC in the spring. So how much does that limit somebody leaving? Now, all eyes are on Florida. What, what are they going to do at Florida? Are a bunch of guys going to bolt there? Are you more likely to leave if you're at a place where you come out of spring practice and go, man, we're not going to be very good and coach isn't going to make it. I'm going to go ahead and find me another place and get out of here. Um, So there's some different variables we're going to keep an eye on. Uh, But I got to see it a little bit before I totally buy into the thought that this is just going to be the most chaotic spring transfer portal window we've ever seen. 
because a lot of these rumors through the last couple of years have not come to fruition. So that's VolQuest's Brent Hubs with us here on the show earlier this morning. If you missed that full conversation, you can check it out wherever you download podcasts. Uh, I think it's interesting, Ramon, because it surprises me a bit, the wait-and-see mentality. And obviously, I trust Brent's instincts on that more than my own, but I think it might be open season this summer. What did I miss about Florida, by the way, too? Well, just Billy Napier. not Billy Napier. Okay, all right, for not sure. Not having any job security. If there's ever going to be a year to do it, then yeah, I think so. The issue that they're going to have is SEC to SEC school said it's not allowed right now. Right. That's where it becomes, I think, problematic to a lot of people as far as SEC players uh, transferring out or Big Ten for that matter. So we're talking about the two power conferences. Like, which ones are we asking or we expect to happen when it comes down to these spring transfers? I think when you look at who you're dealing with, uh, a lot of families, man, and, and this was mine, don't understand the ins and outs of college, don't understand the ins and outs of workings of this transfer portal right now, doesn't understand the ins and outs of maybe commitment to the NIL that you signed that initially got you at that university, too. I look at these situations, these young men and their family and young women also, as far as it pertains to all people being able to jump into the uh, transfer portal, is like buying a car. Everybody's ready to go get one until it's actually time to go spend money and make that decision and take that loan out and all those types of things. It, it, it sounds good to be in a position where you say, I'm wanted elsewhere. But sometimes sitting still for a lot of those guys, as Hub said earlier, they've had times where they've had stories ready and to go. And you got to also look at the emotional side of it to me. Well, I don't know if we'll see a, a, a bigger jump. And for the sake of the show, it would be good just so, so we can talk about it more if there was – a huge exodus for other teams uh, hitting the portal. But they're kids, essentially, still. Young adults. They've already established themselves in school so far. Having the ability to be around their friends for another semester. I think that's why you see a hold back of guys jumping into the portal when it comes down to the springtime. I'm like, you're fully invested in it at that point. It almost makes no sense for me to jump in after the fact. Like, if this was the case, you knew this in the fall. You knew that recruit was coming in. You saw the signing class that they were about to bring in. You also understood that you didn't play a whole lot in the fall. So why make a decision now or try to state your case in the spring if it was the same exact thing back then? Could you make the argument that it's this generation of players as to why they are so encouraged and incentivized to leave? Because hearing you say that, it doesn't sound like you would have known many people who would do spring ball and then say, actually, no, I'm good. I'm going to go elsewhere. Like, how many players did you know who, if they had been able to transfer after spring practice, would have bolted? Probably none. You know, maybe one or two. It was probably two separate years where I thought that guy should probably transfer out. But we couldn't because you had to sit out or go down to level two. My, the initial... Uh, you know, my in 2004, 2005, we had a few high prospects that wanted to leave in my recruiting class. One of them was for they didn't get the number. Another one was because they had the red shirt. Another one was because they weren't going to play enough. You know, say in the first year they were only doing special teams. Like the reason that people hop in the portal or want to transfer is, is most of the time it's small childish things. So you know what happened? They went through that first semester, went through the season of play, and the spring ball happened, and then they were fine. Then they were able to switch their numbers. They were able to go to a position. Some of them had to have surgery. A couple of them had to have a surgery or two. So you can't leave now. And it wasn't like, oh, we're forcing you to have a surgery. No, you had to have surgery. Guys talk about transferring even in my era in 2004 all the way up through. I saw a small amount of guys leave. Guys that ended up leaving the university was because they had to leave because either academics or they got into trouble. To actually transfer out wasn't a thing, and I don't think it's as huge as people make it seem unless there's an opportunity now through NIL. Maybe will in my class two guys. I got one guy in particular that I'm thinking of um, that probably should have left because he just couldn't handle the coaches the the way this particular coach coached him. And I I saw a guy in my class. I ain't gonna say crumble, but I saw a guy be affected by the way the coach was coaching him specifically. And it probably would have been a better situation for him to leave. But most guys no. Here's the thing about it, as Hub said earlier. Most of us go from being the big fish in a small pond until you start swimming with all the sharks. The ones that can survive do. The ones that don't, you play roles and you wait your turn. 
essentially how it goes. And that doesn't matter which university you go to for me or what position. I'm just wary of the fact that through all the court cases, through all the injunctions and through all the rules that have been struck down over the last six months in college athletics, that it might be open season this time around. I feel that. I think the portal might explode in a way in the spring and summer that we've not seen before. What, what do you do if, you lane, if you're lame? You've already got a transfer that's starting at tackle. He is and, already. And, but the overpromising also. That's what I'm saying yeah. is that he's already spent a lot of his money. Like I, I would be curious to have a candid conversation with an SEC coach where you're not getting coach speak. You're getting brutal honesty behind the scenes of how much money have you saved in NIL for the spring cycle of transfers? Because it's interesting. Like, it, uh, How do you as a college football coach plan out how you're going to budget the NIL money you have available to you when you have no idea what the rules are going to be in three months from now? I mean, I've been listening to a podcast recently. I had a conversation with somebody said, in order to operate in the SEC, as far as a roster, a cap, essentially, right. what is it, minimum $7 million? Oof. You need a minimum of $7 million to operate. That seems high. I heard that's the floor. Goodness sakes. Well, that's the floor, Will. Like, respectfully, Vandy needs six million minimum to compete in the SEC. 615 737 1045 is our number. Coming up, how much pressure is on Rick Barnes tonight? And what is the one biggest key for Tennessee basketball? The biggest thing they have to do in order to make their second ever Elite Eight. I've got one key on the defensive side and how to stop Creighton coming up next. Hey, it's Kayla Anderson, and it is that time of the year. We can get outside a little bit, enjoy ourselves, and stop letting that pain in your joints keep you from doing what you want to do this springtime. So call QC Kinetics now. QC Kinetics is the nation's leader in regenerative medicine, and I'm talking about that lasting joint pain relief, no surgery, no drugs, and no downtime. In fact, QC Kinetics is literally transforming lives. Their advanced treatments actually harness your own body's ability to restore and repair that damaged joint tissue. We know that pro athletes have been doing this for decades, but now is the time for this life-changing treatment to be available for you. So you can walk and run, climb stairs, play golf, do whatever you want to do pain-free. No pain pills, no risky surgery. It's an all-natural solution. So take action now and live your best life this spring and summer. You can call QC Kinetics for a free consultation. It's simple. Just dial 615-249-4024. That's 
RKW, Ramon, Kayla, and Will is brewed by 8th and Roast on 104.5 The Zone. 615-737-1045 is how you join us. We've had a lot of good submissions on Twitter this morning on our question of the day, which was, if you were a baseball player, what would your walk-up song be? Uh, Gasolina by Daddy Yankee. Yeah. Submitted by Tay Malone. That's solid. That's solid right there. Ron like Foster, Will Bowling with you. Kayla Anderson with the morning off. Robert Walsh making the show happen. Uh, a classic from Matt on Twitter who writes in, at Ramon Kayla Will, ACDC Thunderstruck. That's another solid one. Classic song. That's not a classic. I, I'm over it. I'm over it. You, you can't use Back in Black. You can't use Hell's Bells. You can't use Thunderstruck. We've been using all of that stuff. We can't use We Are the Champions. You're not using Inter Sandman. You're not using Inter Sandman. You're not using it. That, all no. of that is played out. I know baseball players aren't known for their creativity, especially not when they're trying to gamble. But if you're going to have a pick a song, if you're going to walk up to something, don't pick something that your dad also walked out on it. Like, it just doesn't make sense to me. That's fair. That's pick fair. something creative. Okay. You're your own person. What, what can you get away with? Because it's such a traditional sport. Do the people in the crowd actually care what music the players are, are playing mm. on the walk up, you think? Not really. I mean, maybe the kids do, but like the the old people are just doing the doing the the, the finger wag. You know what I mean? They don't care what it is. <laughs> Roger on YouTube says, "Who hurt you, Bert?" Oh, nobody hurt me. I've just heard all of these songs a thousand, an infinite amount of times yeah. at sporting events since I was a, a young toddler. My other one, I, I know I said right above it as my first choice earlier. Get like me by David Banner is the other one. That's another very popular one, too. That like was, me. I believe, Evan Russell's walk-up song for Tennessee baseball my senior year of college. Mm. And we would go to every single baseball game, and that was that was a good one. That was a good one. That is. That's pretty solid. 615-737-1045 is the number. A congratulations so far to ESPN fan 0353721963's picks. You are number one in the RKW bracket contest so far. So congratulations. congratulations. I didn't know how to add my name. So. <laughs> Shut up. I'm actually, I, uh, from what I saw, I think I'm ranked like 27th in our list, in our in our uh, group. I All I know is uh, that I'm ranked behind my girlfriend in our mm. group who picked James Madison to win the national championship. So, Mark Byington, if you're out there listening, uh, now Nashville resident, congratulations. You had one person in Nashville who picked you to win the national title. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, I, I am tied for 24th. I don't know where you are. I'm actually 35th now. I was going to say, I had to move the page to the second page to find you, so I just didn't really feel like that was worth the effort. Everybody above me sucks, okay? That's that's what's, what's, that's what's so crazy about it. Somebody got a name, Vol Connection, on here. That's actually pretty good. Spelt like Dalton Connect's name. Uh, Gator Mike on Twitter, one of our favorites, says a uh, walk-up song would be the intro guitar on Allison Chain's Man in the Box. There you go. Is that another non-original right there too, Bert? I have not heard of that one. Yeah, I hadn't heard that one. I know Bert's very versed in but his music. Uh, I was also born yesterday. Yeah, that's very true. Anyway. Me too. So, Ramon, today, Tennessee and Creighton, or as late as the game's going to go, early tomorrow morning, Tennessee and Creighton. How much pressure is on Tennessee and Rick Barnes tonight? Rick Barnes probably more than the actual guys. Um, because the player is going to play. Uh, depending on how good they start the game off is where you start to tell that type of uh, pressure being seen. I thought last night watching Clemson, Arizona, you could tell in some of the uh, – one of the commentators said it last night too in the early part of the game. It looked like Arizona is constantly trying to play catch-up, and you could see that pressure on their faces and in their play yesterday, uh, last night. I think the same can hold – True for the Vols. If they can't make those shots or get a run or get a stop, that's where the pressure starts to mount up a little bit more. Rick Barnes, as far as I'm concerned, I think for his legacy set. Let me not say I think he's a Hall of Fame coach. He's done a lot of great work at a lot of great places. Hadn't won the big one, but is putting players in the NBA, have done everything you've asked him to do as a college head coach. There's only so many trophies that can be passed around. And the area that he's in right now, right, Look at the coaches that have been here. Coach K, we're talking about Roy Williams, Bill Self. Everybody's in that conversation. Sometimes there's a log jam onto who can raise the trophy first or last. And Rick Barnes is one of those mainstays that is still left in this tournament that I think is deserving of it. And I, I feel like he will feel some pressure 
to win. It's only so much you can do to get your guys ready, and you're hoping with how he has set up the culture of this team in almost every place that he's been at, that this is the actual perfect setting for him because you know it's going to be defense. You know they're going to be able to get up and down the court, and now he's just let these guys just go be free and shoot the three ball, have the ability to go inside too. And if that recipe doesn't work, I think you have to start to reevaluate, and he will in some sense, how he goes about taking that next step because the same way, and I like using this example from time to time, the same way we saw a really good Kansas City squad be with Alex Smith, Right, They weren't bad. They just had to wait on the right guy with the right style of offense to win them the actual Super Bowl, and that was Patrick Mahomes. I'm not saying Dalton Connect is this. right? What I'm saying is whether his coaching style has to be tweaked in a matter of pushing offense more and saying, hey, we just going to outshoot people, or something has to change as far as the way he schemes and put players on the court because he's got the goods. He's been good everywhere he's been at. What is that final tweak if they don't make it to the Final Four or win a natty that he has to adjust to? So that's why I think the pressure falls on him more than the actual players because it's his culture, his game plan, and the guys that he chose. Isn't it difficult, too, because you talk about Rick Barnes' legacy being set. To me, unfortunately, his legacy is being unable to get to the Final Four. And it's not totally fair to him because you have games like Michigan a couple of years ago where Tennessee just doesn't make wide open shots. You have FAU last year where, again, Tennessee just doesn't make shots. I want to go ahead and set down the precedent, though, before this game that how much of the blame goes to Rick Barnes if Tennessee simply just has another bad shooting performance like it did against Texas, but ultimately it's not enough, right? Because while, yes, the game is a crapshoot and there is amount of three-point luck and two-point luck and just luck that goes into winning an NCAA tournament, when we're telling the same story over and over again, it's less about luck at this point and more about, okay, even if Tennessee does miss shots, who put the roster together, right? Like, who supplemented the roster and decided to go with Jordan Ganey instead of maybe a guy who could make more open threes. And and Jordan Ganey was a great offensive player at USC Upstate. But, like, why is he not that here? Why is he not that scorer that he was at the mid-major level? And and I'm asking these questions as hypotheticals if that's what happens tonight. Because I want to go ahead and put this on the record now that I don't think Rick Barnes has been as bad in the tournament when he's been at Tennessee as a lot of people make him out to be. As a coach. As a – just – Period. Okay. Roster builder, coach, CEO of the program and everything. Uh, Ryan Shumpert of Rocky Top Insider, who's on this show a good bit, put this out on Twitter um, earlier this week after Tennessee beat Texas. Wins in the NCAA tournament during Rick Barnes's tenure. For how much people obsess over Bruce Pearl and talk about how Bruce Pearl always has his teams ready to play in March. Tennessee has more wins than Auburn does in the NCAA tournament since Rick Barnes took over. Rick Barnes at Tennessee has eight. Bruce Pearl and Auburn have seven. In that same time, Kentucky has two more wins than Tennessee in the tournament. Arkansas has one. Those are the only teams with more wins than Tennessee in the NCAA tournament since Rick Barnes took the job in Knoxville. I think the difficult part of the way we evaluate Rick Barnes is there hasn't been that one deep run to skew those stats at all, right? Because if you ask an Auburn fan, would you rather have three first round exits, but you get a final four in your fourth one. Or you can be like Tennessee and you enter the round of 32 and then you lose, or you maybe make one or two runs to the sweet 16, then you lose. You're going to take the one that gives you the banner. You're always going to pick the final four, regardless of if that means you fall to Yale, you lose to other teams in the first round, you're going to take the final four banner. I think all that to say, Ramon, Tennessee just needs one run. They just need one, right? And then the narrative, then the legacy for Rick Barnes starts to change quickly. And sometimes hindsight is 2020 on these things. We look back on Bruce Pearl now and think, oh, maybe he wasn't as as dynamic, wasn't as good of a March coach as we originally thought that he was because he's had so many first round exits and it's, it's feast or famine. But we can start to change the legacy of Rick Barnes tonight if he gets this team to a place that only Bruce Pearl has ever taken them to the Elite Eight. Yeah. 
That's a strong conversation right there because there's so many different variables that go into it. And you mentioned tonight, as far as the Vols is concerned, where, where's the blame if something goes wrong? I think, honestly, in, in this particular year, with Vescovy being 24-25, Josiah, same age, Dalton, coming from a mid-major, no, a small school, and turning into the SEC Player of the Year in a – a player of the year finalist, like a strong player of the year finalist, Zakai, who understands it and cleaned up and got some hardware too as far as defensive player of the year in the SEC, first team. Um, I, I put this more on the players. The shot selection, the pressure that they will feel as far as if it's a tight game, like that goes to them. Now, yes, Coach Barnes is supposed to pull them over to the side and say, hey, calm down and, and really reset them. That's where his coaching has to come into play. But even just last night and, and watching the uh, Arizona game, those guys were rushing shots because they felt the pressure of trying to be good really quick instead of just going through what they're supposed to. This group, to me, is a little bit too veteran to allow them to have some excuses, though. Like, the shots have to fall. Like, I think it's super – I, I I think there's no excuse whatsoever for Gainey to go 0 for 6. This team that hit three three-pointers last weekend, that to me is a player issue more than it is a coach issue. It's one of those things where I can't run the play for you. And it's essentially just that for that group. This this is by far one of the strongest teams in the entire, mar- in, 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 entire tournament. It is. And they got to approach it like that. There can be no surprises. Best thing about them playing on a Friday night as opposed to yesterday on first night of the Sweet 16 round is they saw what Arizona could look like. And it was brought to my attention last night that Arizona and Tennessee are very similar in how they get hot and cold, how they miss shots. They don't they they play from behind and get close enough. The the Kentucky Tennessee game in Knoxville, three weeks ago at this point, two weeks ago at this point now, three weeks ago, we felt that team was good enough to come back and win. But, of course, breakdowns and defense is the same thing that Arizona had last night. They got schemed up. I thought Coach Barnes somewhat got outcoached in Knoxville. You had no plan for how they double-teamed uh, Dalton. You had no plan on how you was going to come back and score, and the guys weren't simply making their shots. Easy layups, miss, and foul trouble, too. Those, to me, are player-related things when it comes down to how you look at who's going to, you know, who whose head going to fall on the sword when it comes down to pointing blame at them. I personally put more pressure on two guys, and I've been saying it for a little while, too. And it's a third one in the mix, too. But Josiah and Vescovy, it doesn't have to end. That's the mindset of it to me. Those two have been the pillars in in that room, that university. Heck, they're on leadership councils. I heard Vescovy speak last week. It sounded like he's actually from the South. He's been here for so long, okay? (laughs) Like, legitimately, I'm like, that boy got a Southern twang to him now. Like, that's how long he's been there. And they've known each other. They've played a lot of ball. This win has to happen tonight for the justification, I think, of their careers in a sense. They've had great careers at Tennessee. Some of the most iconic, as as far as how long they've been there and what they've done and how familiar you are with them. Uh, it falls on them more than I feel like Coach Barnes at this point. It's interesting. I think the key for Tennessee is the way Creighton shoots from three. I think Tennessee will rebound its own misses enough to have chances at the rim. I think Tennessee surely cannot shoot as poorly as it did against Texas two games in a row. I don't think you're going to see that kind of performance for the second straight time. What worries me about Creighton is their ability to just go lights out unconscious from three and force your offense to have to score 80 to 90 points. Similarly to the way Kentucky made a ton of threes against Tennessee in the last game of the regular season. Creighton is ranked number 11 by Ken Palm at the three-point line, scoring 39.9% of its points from three. They are number 326, Ramon, in college basketball. In scoring from two-point range, Creighton is. Number what again? They are number 326 in college basketball (laughs) with only 45.5% of their points coming from inside the arc. You know what I see happening with a squad like them? The same thing that happened to us in the last game. And if they can't adjust to not being free shooters at the three-point line, then that's that. That's where it becomes problematic. And pressure, I'm hoping, is what becomes a problem at, a problem for them at the three point line. The thing that gives Tennessee trouble, among other things, is an elite big man, 
Creighton does have that Ryan Kalkbrenner, the Big East Defensive Player of the Year. They're going to play drop coverage with him, and on a ball screen at the top of the key, he is simply going to drop, and he is going to be a force field around the rim. He is going to sit right in front of the rim with his hands up and say, shoot over me, I dare you. Because Creighton wants you to take the three with five seconds left on the shot clock. They want you to settle for a mid-range jumper. Creighton does not want you to get to the rim. But I think the thing that also beats Tennessee is guards that can turn over Tennessee and can turn over Sakai Ziegler, that is something that Creighton does not do. Creighton's turnover percentage defensively is only 11%. That is 362nd in all of college basketball. This Creighton team does not foul. They do not force turnovers, though, either. And that's a little bit of a a double-edged sword, right? If you're defending aggressively enough to create turnovers, yeah, you might have another foul or two per game for some of your key players, but you're also not going to create as many turnovers. It's kind of like how, Ramon, we say sometimes it's not the worst thing if you do get a holding call every now and then on the offensive line because it right. means you're you're at least in the right position, right? Yeah, yeah, Things absolutely. of that nature where, mm-hmm. like, if you're getting blown by, you're probably not holding anybody. Or, you know, if you're just playing for Alabama, you're not holding anybody. But yeah. that's just because you play for Alabama. Yeah. But anyway, I, I do think... Creighton, in the way they shoot 37% from three-point range, they shoot more threes than nearly every team in the country. If Tennessee can defend on the perimeter and then run in transition when they get those long rebounds off of missed threes, that's what interests me about this game. I, I think it's a fascinating matchup. I think stylistically, a Tennessee team who loves to play a wrestling match with you in the paint, going up against a Creighton team that hasn't had anyone foul out of a game all season, Yet they only play seven guys is nuts. That's that's a wild combination to watch. And I'm curious to see the way each team tries to impose its will tonight. So uh, a game that this has been pointed out, of course, is Providence, right? Familiarity there. Former Tennessee assistant Kim English. The head Kim coach English there. is there. What's fascinating at the last box score of watching, uh, looking at their game, they matched them as far as three-pointers. Well, I'll say this percentage-wise. Creighton, to your point, went 14 for 29, 40, 48% from the three-point line. They were matched also by Providence. Providence went 11 for 26, a little bit more efficient as far as the amount of uh, three-pointers they shot at 42%. The separator, again, is where you hope happens the same way it did in the Texas game for the Vols. Creighton had 12 turnovers. Providence had eight. That may be the separator in, in, in a game like this where – if they're shooting, you got to match. That's why I'm hoping as far as Vescovy is concerned, that under the weather turns into a flu game for him to where it's just, look, right. minimal movement for him. Spot up, dude, we're going to get you the ball. Or the same for Dalton. The other interesting part of that is Creighton is not good at rebounding its own misses. They just get back or they, go. They just, they, if they miss a three, odds are that long rebound is going to be controlled by you, not them. Uh, Creighton is not as effective on the offensive glass. They only rebound 26% of their misses, which is not a particularly high mark. So interesting matchup. I I think even for the non Vols fan, it's just going to be a really fun basketball game. I hope it's a great night cap. I do. I mean, it's the equivalent of a very good offensive coordinator. And it's the equivalent of like Lamar Jackson going up against Steve Spagnola. Like you're having a very good offensive mind in Greg McDermott go up against a very good defensive mind in Rick Barnes. And that style clash is always fun to watch. 615-737-1045, the number. There are things around the NFL draft, some rumors circulating. ESPN with multiple contributors writing about prospects whose, uh, uh, whose stocks are rising the most. Which ones do believe? Do we believe? Which ones do we not believe? We'll talk about that next. It's Ramon Foster for Hiller Plumbing, Heating, Cooling, and Electrical. I actually got to get some electrical stuff done around the backyard, man. They will be coming by soon enough, man. But this month is Happy Golden Ticket Sweepstake at Hiller. And you're probably wondering, Ramon, what is this? Well, first and foremost, enter to win at Hiller 
goldenticket.com. All you got to do is use your email and you're automatically entered to win. The prizes include a $5,000 Hiller gift card. There's also a $1,000 Hiller gift card available to you or one of the 10 Happy Hiller Club memberships that they are passing out also. Or this, simply take advantage of the zero interest financing for 48 months on select new HVAC system if you need one, never know when that happens, or 36 months on a tankless water heater or whole home generators. Don't miss out. Enter to win now at HillerGoldenTicket.com.
Friday morning on RKW, Ramon, Kayla, and Will is brewed by 8th and Roast. Headlines you've missed coming up in 15 minutes. 615-737-1045, the number. Ramon Foster, who is the player in the NFL draft process who you have changed your opinion on in the last, I'll give you a month and a half, last six weeks? Is there a player that you have become more open to or less open to? Tyler Fawaga. Ooh, interesting. Okay. Tally Fawaga. Right I, tackle out of Oregon State. I didn't see him as high rated as some. Held him. Remember, we had that conversation before. When you guys had me do my breakdown on him, it was about a month or two ago at this point. But Tally Fawaga, I didn't see what other people were seeing in him. And I think I was basing it. I don't want to make an excuse for it. Screw it. I think I was based on the fact of what I thought the Titans needed. And a lot of people high on the guy that is going to play right tackle. And I was just like, I don't, I don't see him playing left is what I kept saying. But after watching this tape, understanding his play and name, we met him at the Senior Bowl and stuff like that. His ability to play a physical style of ball, I honestly think if Harbaugh could go back, that's the dude he's taking at right tackle. Taking a right tackle at five to me is a little too rich, okay? But that's the dude that, that I think Harbaugh would love to have. If you want a physical run I'm talking about strength. Is his run blocking? You want to do like him. He's a tone setter type that loves to play physical and will look you dead in your eyes until you bring it. I like him now, definitely. How much do you believe the Chargers are in the tackle market? They have Trey Pipkins there at right, Rashawn mm-hmm. Slater at left. Do you think that's a smokescreen? Jim Harbaugh talking about all the O-line stuff in Orlando this week? I think, honestly, Jim was just giving a, a clinic. I just I think that's who he is. Yeah. I agree with you. I, I think he was just giving the clinic right there, and they want to speculate it to be, to, you know, to lend itself to the draft. I think it was smoke and mirrors for the most part. If they take him, I wouldn't be shocked because heck, he's a top five guy. Right. But I think he was just putting on the clinic. You got to think he's back in the NFL. He's probably just happy to be here again. I think he's leaning into his philosophy as a coach, knowing that it doesn't hurt him sitting there with the number five overall pick to float out there that he might want to tackle and then to go wide receiver. Um, I think the thing he's more specifically doing that we've talked about on this show before is he's trying to make J.J. McCarthy enough of a big prospect for someone to move up to number four with the Arizona Cardinals, take him at four, that way he can take Marvin Harrison Jr. What, what do, I, I believe that too, and I'll say this also. I also think he's setting a uh, – he's coaching through the press. Yeah. That offensive line got to get it together. You he's gotta, trying to set the tone. Yeah, he's setting the tone for, <laughs> for what OTAs is going to look like. For sure. Yep, definitely. Uh, Bert, who is someone you've changed your opinion on in the draft process? I'm going to go with wide receiver Keon Coleman. Uh, mm. I think he's gotten a lot of slack uh, through this whole draft process. And the stat a lot of people keep throwing out is the 33% contested catch rate. Saying like, oh, if he's this big of a target, he should have better hands. Why is he not pulling these in? Well, I looked at the stats, uh, I've looked at the games, uh, not every game he's played in, but a lot of the games from last year, and they really forced the ball to him and Johnny Wilson a lot. So much so that you're like, why doesn't Jordan Travis take the dump off? Or why doesn't he just hand it off to the running back? Or It, it seemed like they were always looking for the big play, and that 33% contested catch rate also includes his uh, – Uh, uncatchable balls, balls that were targeted to him, but he did not catch in a contested catch situation. So I think that number skewed. Uh, A lot of people were like, oh, he, my my buddy the other day was like, he's, he's Devontae Parker for me. If, if Keon Coleman plays as long as Devontae Parker did, then he is worth a second round pick. (laughs) He is worth the pick that you draft him with. I think that's a, a big misconception between fans. Oh, he was he was never an all pro receiver. If he is a good receiver, he is worth the second round pick. I, I am much higher on Keon Coleman than uh, a lot of the other uh draft people. I'm glad you said that. As as far as fans saying what's what's bust and what's uh a success, like years in the league might mean success. Like say what you want to again, and I had to recheck myself on this guy. Clowning. He's double-digit years now. Has he lived up to the number one overall pick? No, he hasn't. But he continues to get on teams and make plays here and there for him. He's a solid pro who is more of a disruptor than he is a finisher. 
at the edge rusher in a defensive line yeah. position. And he, he's set a bad precedent for himself with that hit that we all saw a million times in the draft. They thought that was who he was going to be forever. And playing on the same line as J.J. Watt, he just had injuries. And yeah. he was never going to be that player. He's just a very balanced outside linebacker. Can play the run very well, can play the pass very well, and like Will said, a, a very a good disruptor. Solid, yeah, a solid pro is what you call him. I think I've changed my opinion on Jaden Daniels. I'm on the Jaden Daniels QB2 train. I don't hate that. Um, did you guys hear what Brian Kelly said yesterday about this? <laughs> letting, uh, letting it out of the bag a little so bit. So he had a long soliloquy about how he thinks Jaden Daniels is ready to be the guy, you know, strong and tangibles, all these things. Maybe we can find the audio of this and play it coming up at 9. And at the end of it goes, you know, I, I think he'll be a great fit in Washington. <laughs> he said it. Yeah. I'm paraphrasing a bit, but his last comment literally was like, yeah, you know, it'd be good for Washington. And then it just cuts oh, off. Oh, Lord. Come on. Uh, we've doing? got this here. Robert's got it. So committed to taking care of himself um, that you don't have to worry about size or he doesn't weigh enough. Uh, Lamar's done a pretty good job with his size. I think uh, Mahomes, I wouldn't consider him a giant because he's going to get the ball out to the playmakers and, and make plays uh, for Washington. <laughs> oh, he said for Washington. He said for Washington. <laughs> maybe it's wishful thinking, right? Maybe he's trying to do the coach thing. Like, I know he's not going one. <laughs> so maybe. You, you know what's happening? I guarantee somebody's been like, Coach, you shouldn't have said that. Oh, it'll be all right. He, when he's worrying his face Nobody off. Nobody will right? catch that. Nobody will catch that. <laughs> was that. Brian, buddy. He said for Washington. He said for Washington, yeah. Wait a I, if Jane Daniels goes to the right landing spot. I, you could make the argument he could have a better career than Caleb Williams. I worry because about Washington. Chicago Bears are a graveyard for quarterbacks. And so is Washington, to be fair. Oh. Interesting. 615-737-1045. We'll dive into more of these draft rumors, whether or not they are real or fake. Mike Golick Jr. will share his thoughts about that as well at 920. We'll get food and football with Mike, as we always do. <laughs> There is a chain that is adding something to their menu that Mike is very excited about on social media. We'll talk about that. Uh, we will reset the show for you. Headlines you've missed so far this morning as Hour 4 begins next. All right, it is March my goodness, it's almost April to tell you the truth. But uh, the moral of the story is it's getting a little bit warmer out there. It's supposed to be a beautiful day today. Maybe it is time then to crack open your windows, do some spring cleaning. And when you do open those windows and get in the cool breeze, make sure that they're opening properly. If they're cracked, leaking, or they just won't stay open, now is the time to call our friends at Window Nation because that probably means you need new windows. Buy two windows, get two free. Plus right now, zero down, zero interest, and zero payments for 24 months. Great deal. No doubt about it. And on top of that, Kayla, over 20,000 online positive, positive reviews. They've installed over 200,000 windows in the last year. That's 40 times more than the average company, man. Windows is all they do, okay? As Kayla just told you, buy two, get two free, and pay nothing with no interest for two full years. Reach out to them at 866 nation or go online, windownation.com.
What's going on? Nine o'clock. Good morning. Happy Friday from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. I am Robert Walsh. Only one higher-seeded team was victorious last night. Let's check the scores. Clemson taking down Arizona 77-72. UConn over San Diego State 82-52. Alabama beats UNC 89-87. And Illinois sends Iowa State home 72-69. Games start today with NC State. That is the lowest-seeded team left in the tournament. They're taking on Marquette at 6-10. You can listen to that right here on 104.5 The Zone. Opening day was yesterday, but not for Braves fans. They will be stuck to the television Today at 2.05 as the Braves tank on the Phillies. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and the Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Fourth and final hour of the show and hour 20 of another full week. Ramping it up right now on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. RKW is brewed by 8th and Rose, the best coffee in the Music City. You find it when you travel out of Nashville or back into Nashville at the airport. Or you can stop by the Broadview at Vanderbilt in Midtown, 8th Avenue, and Charlotte as well. Your favorite retail bag of 8th and Rose coffee is available at your local Kroger or Whole Foods in Middle Tennessee. 615-737-1045 is how you jump in with Ramon Foster and Robert Walsh. My name is Will Bowling. Kayla yeah, yeah, Anderson yeah. has the morning off. Streaming live on 104.5 The Zone TV. Twitch, YouTube, Facebook Live, or Twitter. Twitter, Twitter please. I see, I threw your curveball there. It's Friday, and I'm properly acting like it is what I'm doing. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> there he is. It is funny when we don't play the Friday song every hour, yeah. the texts and messages that we'll get. Where's the Friday song? I oh, know. I oh, know. If y'all get the opportunity to go to a Titans open practice on Friday or any NFL city, man, this will most likely be playing. And it's such a cool song before you labor again. It's funny, we've even gotten a text from Jasper Schaefer about that, of like, what, where's the Friday song? I'm in the car. Jasper? I mean, Juniper Schaefer really Juju. makes makes it known when he wants to hear the Friday song. Juju Schaefer. Yeah. Yes, definitely, man. Always good to hear from Josephine. Josephat, also. Funny thing is, I have run out of J names off the top of my head to make Schaefer, so I've literally Googled names that start with J, and I'm just reading them right now to tell J- myself a little bit. Jamal. Jamal Schaefer. Journey Schaefer. Journey is real good. Javante Schaefer. Uh, Duck on YouTube says Friday song is played out. Well, you, you're you on YouTube. You can't even hear it. So why yeah. is it played out to you? Come on, Duck. You're better than this. You're you, you, you going to hate from outside the club. You can't even get in. Yeah, you can't even hear the song, man. It is um, maybe time for a, a refresh of some sort. Yeah. Uh, a secondary cool Friday option of telling the people that it's Friday and we should act like it. We miss playing March Madness at least once a week by future. Oh, there's we, still time. we did it once. We did do it once. This we're, is the final hour of the month. It is the final hour of the Dang, month. Dang, don't put it like that. I like March. It's a fun month. Yeah, it, it is. It has been a fun month. It has. I'll give you that. It is a good one. Yeah, April's here after this weekend. What is April Fool's Day? Monday. Monday. Dang. <laughs> you well, have so many ideas. Don't get God. How are you going to uh, celebrate April Fool's Day with Buck Rising? That, thank you. You know I wouldn't hit y'all with anything oh, no, good. Of course not. I, I'd hit Buck with the best stuff. Yeah. You, as, as you should. As I think should. we should. Okay, here, here's what I'm thinking. I, I can't. This isn't going to work. But in my head, I would come up with a company email 
that's like, congratulations, like you guys have done so well, like since the beginning of the year, you're getting Monday off. So Buck just doesn't come into work. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> that would never work, though. And I think that would be more work on Lucas's part. It would be a worse prank on yeah, Lucas than it would, it would be, be for be. Buck. <laughs> Buck would end up with cucumbers on his eyes somewhere while Lucas is doing all the heavy lifting. Maybe the better prank then is to give Lucas the day off. There you go. And oh. make Buck just <laughs> produce his own show. <laughs> I mean, he somewhat owes Lucas. He went to the West Coast on Lucas for a wedding. It was, oh, he didn't mention he it or excuse. tweet about it at all. He did? He he didn't mention that? No. Okay, I thought you knew. I saw it all over social media. Oh, yeah. I had no idea. Huh, interesting. Uh, but he owes Lucas, you know, a little bit of get back. That's all it is. We are flickering right now. What is going yeah, on? it's like I just had an idea. A light bulb just turned on over me. 615-737-1045 is our number. Jimmy and Franklin, first up to begin Hour 4. What's up, Jimmy? What's up, Jimmy? What's up, boys? Hey, how we doing? Hey, how we doing? First off, uh, Will, I'm with you on The Gentleman. Great show. I watched it Thank you. on your recommendation. Good. So Whoa. well done there, sir. Uh, secondly, Jester Schaefer's uh, AI thing is overplayed. That's <laughs> I, I like the song. <laughs> But I don't like the AI thing. I think it's okay. Stupid. Fair enough. Um, and um, what I called about was um, Ran. I feel like has low key been a phenomenal GM in his early tenure with the with the Titans. So I think he he made a lot of those picks last year. Every one of the picks in the draft contributed, which is very to me is very rare. Right when you have all your picks actually contribute the phone that that year their rookie year um now as a as unpopular as maybe getting rid of um uh our our uh, safety buyer um buyered uh as unpopular as that was it looked like it turned out to be the right move um he let the king kind of play out his year here and you know leave on a on a high note uh, I thought that was really good, and I, I really th- all the moves he's made in, in the off season this year have been fantastic. So um, I think Rand deserves a lot of props, and I'll give you guys uh, one Friday goodbye, and here it is. It's Friday. <laughs> 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 he just jumped into a pit there at the end. What was that? <laughs> Did you jump out of plane? Look, you can criticize us all you want to, as long as you compliment me first. <laughs> Get that is the lesson we learned in that call. Um, get out of here, man. Rand has done a good job. Ramon, we've talked about it a lot that I think maybe a lot. Eh, I want to be careful how I choose my words. Maybe there's more to last year's offseason plan that Rand had to accept was already in place. Yeah. And go along with what Ryan Cowden and John Robinson had planned for last offseason. I, I think, and, I, and that could mean. A couple of things. That means some of the negative things that happen might not have been all on Rand Carthon. I think I would not be surprised if Andre Dillard was more of a previous administration idea yeah. that Mike Vrabel perhaps brought to the forefront and Rand Carthon and them finished. But it also means that some of the success stories also give Ryan Cowden some credit as well. Because we know from the reporting we've we've seen out there that a lot of that draft board was made before Rand Carthon was even in the building. I, I think this offseason is Rand's offseason, and he's got a lot of money to work with, um, and he's got a big draft ahead of him. Yeah, he does, man. And when you come in as a new guy, too, you can't ruffle too many feathers. That's one way to get out, <laughs> out it and also just a, a divide within the building, too. So you got to play coy with a lot of people, man, when it comes down to you being the new guy. Um, seeing to what uh, Jimmy said earlier, man, about the moves that's been made, how these signings have been kind of, uh, you know, finished is, is essentially what it was. The, the, the getting the Calvin Ridley. Nobody saw it coming, right? Uh, and I know the conversation has been strong for a very long time on the Legere Sneed, but when you, you're been told that, hey, you got to give up a second, and then it's not that situation, and then you only got to swap sevens in 2024 and just give up a two, I mean, give up a three next year, that's a deal, that's a steal. And, of course, that comes with money. But I, I think when you look at the way the collaboration of Rand and Coach Callahan and Everybody else that's involved in making these type of decisions as far as getting these deals done, you got to be somewhat optimistic about what they can do for you. 
again, I don't know what other GMs were like before John Robinson. I got the back end of where John Robinson was cooking. He was, and J-Rob, we trust. Remember those those conversations oh, yeah. were heavy in 2020 and 2021, and then it just fizzled out. I think you see the moves that Rand has made, and hopefully it's, it's sustainable with the guys you've brought in and how you brought those dudes in, too. Uh, I, I don't think there's anybody you can just turn your nose up at as far as players. I know a lot of people are going to mention Kenneth Murray. I don't think his role is going to be asked to be the coverage guy. I think he has the ability in him because he's a frigging crazy athlete. It may, it may mean scheming and, 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 and technique that we've heard that Frank Bush was good at. Um, and you can probably throw the Sadiq Charles in there, but he's depth with the potential to become a reserve slash starter and waiting if you need him to. Good, smart moves, hopefully with some some uh, some level of sustainability about it. Interesting uh, ESPN Plus piece about latest buzz on players whose stocks are rising the most after pro day performances. Uh, our friend Matt Miller says, Audric Estime, running back from Notre Dame, who did not run well at the Combine uh, and then ran a 4.58 that has been a bit closer to what he actually looked like at Notre Dame at his pro day. Field Yates writes J.J. McCarthy as someone who weighed in at 220 pounds up from his listed weight of 202 and in line with his combine number that he, he threw well. Uh, and Jordan Reed of ESPN says Spencer Rattler is the guy he thinks stock has risen the most. You're side-eyeing that one, Ramon Foster. Spencer Rattler, stop. I, I, I get it. He's supposed to be that good. But other than the game in what South Carolina stole signals, never. I mean, my bad, allegedly. <laughs> my bad. That was wrong to say, allegedly, right? Other than that one game, where has he cooked? Ugh. He had you had him this 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 one year removed from what they did to the Vols in 2022. Well, and defenders of him will say that he had as porous of an offensive line as Will Stop. Levis did his last year at Kentucky. Stop. That offensive line in South Carolina was bad last year. It, it was. It was. But, again, you're supposed to overcome some bad play at times. Nothing excites me about Spencer Rattler, and that's just me. Right. But, I mean, as far as stock rising, like, Jordan Reed says, Rattler has generated plenty of buzz after his pro day. AFC's area scout said, I think a team may take a chance on him somewhere in round two. In round two? For Spencer Rattler. You were robbed of your career, Will. That, to me, is... Uh, that sounds like he knows him personally. That's, that's like the rumor of Malik Willis moving into the first round yeah. a couple of years ago. Uh, I, two, late two, maybe three or four is where I see a guy like Spencer Rattler. Like to me, I think the same questions you have about Joe Milton is the same ones you have about Spencer Rattler to me. Can they actually play? Coming up next, our good friend Mike Golick Jr. joins the show. A guy who certainly knows his way around Notre Dame football as well as food and everything in between. A broad spectrum from Mike Golick Jr. We can ask him exactly how good Joe Alt is from his perspective and what is the best item that he is looking forward to trying in a new weird connection of chain restaurants. Love it. Only the way Mike Golick Jr. can answer it next.
Friday morning on RKW is brewed by Eighth and Roast on 104.5 The Zone. Will Balding, Ramon Foster with you. Kayla Anderson's got the morning off. And I love it on a Friday when we can talk with Mike Golick Jr. Because if there was the equivalent of a Friday in a guest, <laughs> Mike, Joel, Mike Golick Jr. has more Friday energy than maybe anyone else who joins this radio program, even if it was a Monday or a Tuesday. Mike, good morning. Good morning. That's the nicest thing anyone has said about quite a long time. When you do a radio show with your dad, you think it's going to be all like compliments and flowery stuff. But he actually, I mean, I think he uses it to take out maybe some frustrations about things that I did to him when I was a kid. So it's nice to come someplace and be loved on. I saw you beefing with him, man. Well, you're not beefing with him. You called him out on his crap. It was like, look, I am your son. And it was it was interesting, (laughs) Mike. Listen, you know what? Every once in a while, dad's been doing this for a long time. Dad's got a ton of experience. He's got a ton of great stuff and got a great valuable perspective as a guy that played as long in the league as he did and has covered it the way he did. But sometimes he's just wrong. And you know what? There's a lot of other people. I found this out at ESPN when we were doing the morning show together is because he's a two-time radio Hall of Famer and because he's had this long career and is so respected, there were a lot of people that were afraid to step to him. And so I said, you know what? No, I got 30-plus years of experience making this guy's life a living hell at certain <laughs> moments. And so why wouldn't I just bring that to the air and remind him he's wrong in front of a national audience? <laughs> Genius, man. I love it. Those who can do, okay? As a, mm-hmm. You can keep that one. That's for free right there, Mike. <laughs> I appreciate the game. And you know what? As a, you know what? That's something else that's also on brand. Ref- Ramon Foster giving me game for free has always been the case, so I greatly appreciate it. Sir. Well, you my God, Mike Mike Golick Jr., Gojo and Golick uh, on Twitter. Um, uh, Mike, uh, before we talk about Joe Alt and uh, the man that I think all of Tennessee Titans fans have just fallen totally in love with, the left tackle position, uh, what is the item in the Krispy Kreme and McDonald's crossover that you are most excited to see on their menu in a couple of years? Uh, you know, I need. I, I see. I've been in the firm camp for a while. Big breakfast sandwich guy. Yep. I think the McDonald's McGriddle is one of the true triumphs of human ingenuity that we've seen in the modern era. And so, this idea of getting a McGriddle, where for anyone uninitiated, it's the like sausage, egg, and cheese, or bacon, egg, and cheese breakfast sandwich, basically two syrup infused pancake like buns as the outer portion of the sandwich mm. to have that now where maybe we're injecting a little bit of syrup into the Krispy Kreme buns of this like that McGriddle, I think would be something that just sent me to the moon. I'm going to just let that breathe for a second. Okay. <laughs> Cause my, I was prepared to ask you another question and that was too, I, I was too good and too thought out for you to just move uh, us to move past that. You okay to move forward? Will? <laughs> well, for I me, I was going to say a Krispy Kreme donut McFlurry where you have like oh. donut bits infused oh. into a McFlurry was going to be interesting. Okay. Yeah. No, now we're cooking with that. <laughs> and to, to Ramon's point, we're going to have to move away because this weird thing happens when I talk about food on air or like do ad reads for food companies is it's hard to get through it because the drool starts forming in my <laughs> mouth and I start choking on my words. So we could talk about football soon, mostly so I don't start salivating all over my phone. Perfect. Well, uh, Mike Golick Jr. is our guest. Uh, and you know Notre Dame linemen very well. And you know that Titans fans are salivating over Joe Alt in a Tennessee Titans uniform. Uh, that's how we'll make our seamless transition here. Uh, Mike, what do you like about Joe, and and what do you think makes him the best tackle in this draft? So I, I think there's a couple of things here, and Ramon knows this as well as anyone, just how much the league has changed in terms of practice time and what that, I think, puts a premium on for linemen especially coming into the draft, you just don't have as much on-field time to develop a lot of these guys that might be incredibly talented and might have incredible skills, but maybe aren't coming out as clean. Joe Alt comes with an immediate pedigree coming out of a program like Notre Dame where he was coached by Harry Heastan during that time. Joe Rudolph, who's there now, obviously put on a lot of great prospects during his time at Wisconsin. And so he comes in as technically sound as any guy in this class. And I think having that as a foundation and then, oh, by the way, he's a mountain of a man. Like when you're around him in person and I've seen him on tape, I'd watched him on TV. But when I got out to campus and was around him in person, just the sheer challenge of a defender having to get around that guy who not only is all of six, eight certainly has the great size and width, but then you see the arm length and 
for a lot of guys, when you measure arm length, I'm always curious, where does it show up on tape? For Joe, there's no hiding it. You see defenders constantly kept at arm's reach away from a guy who's got those incredible skills and gifts. So I think when you combine the physical prowess along with the pedigree that was developed there and the technique that was coached into him, you have a guy that's ready to come in and provide an instant impact for a team that right now in Tennessee seems to believe, hey, we're ready to compete right now based on the offseason moves they're making. No doubt about it, Mike. And that's, that's fascinating what you say about all. I've been playing devil's advocate here for about a week or two, man, on the idea that, look, they can go defense, right? I just want to understand, get get your opinion on, okay, there will be an adjustment period for all, on the offensive line the way it is for most offensive linemen. Welcome into the NFL. If you were to play devil's advocate yourself for a guy like Dallas Turner out of uh, LSU, how would you present that as far as the defensive players seem to have immediate success or it's a little bit of a slow roll sometime for OL. Yeah, no, it, it's totally understandable. And, and you're right. Like, even for the most pro-ready offensive line prospect, and if you were going to look at Joe specifically, the worry for some people has been, hey, maybe he's not quite as violent as you'd like with his hands. Maybe there's not as much pop as a guy like Olu Fashanu out of Penn State. And so maybe that worries you a little bit at the top end there. And you're right. We've even seen, you know, look at a guy at New York. I know they're going through it right now with Evan Neal, but Andrew Thomas even coming into the league out of Georgia, another blue chip prospect coming out of a place that at that time was Sam Pittman as the O-line coach was making incredibly technically sound offensive linemen. It took Andrew Thomas a while to develop into the Pro Bowl caliber player that we've seen here. And so maybe if you think, well, we don't have time to waste, you can take a guy like Dallas Turner, who's in God, I, watching that guy on tape is so fascinating because last year you watched him next to Will Anderson Jr. who ended up being one of the top five guys picked in the draft and who was so technically sound and ruthlessly efficient and always making plays but I constantly felt my eye wandering over to Dallas Turner because you would see him do things physically with his bend with his acceleration with his closing speed that a lot of guys just don't walk out of the hospital with it's one of those things you can't coach and so to inject that onto a defensive front that's always been such a strength for Tennessee that's going to look a little bit different this year because of the coaching change, but still has talented pieces and Jeffrey Simmons at the core of that, man, it, it's hard not to get enticed by that sexy skill set that a guy like Dallas has. And at seven where the Titans pick at, they may have the run of the mill of whoever they want to. Some even speculating uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. I mean, you got Malik Neighbors in that conversation. All is there. And it's because of this, Mike. Why, why are we suckered in each and every year <laughs> on this quarterback fiasco? Why, Mike? You know, it, it's interesting. I saw uh, the the folks over at the third team did a kind of article where they pulled a bunch of league personnel and front office execs about why teams have been so willing to churn through young quarterback prospects faster than ever. We saw it this last offseason, right, as the Jets sunsetted Zach Wilson last year. Mac Jones is gone out in New England. Justin Fields from Chicago. The rookie wage scale and the fact that they cost comparatively less certainly goes into a lot of that. And so teams are more willing to take big swings and misses. We see it in free agency all the time. We see it at the trade deadline with teams right now. I just think this young crop of GMs have become hyper aggressive in basically every way they approach this. And you know this, Ramon, like it's the easiest way to help change everyone's fortunes can at times be, or at least the thought process is, with a quarterback. Now, I think we're seeing more and more examples of how much the environment they're walking into matters. And some of these teams, to your point, that are going to try and trade up and take a quarterback are going to overestimate their current culture, overestimate their current roster's capabilities, and likely do what we've seen happen to a bunch of the names I just mentioned, likely ruin these guys' careers before they even get started. Mike Golick Jr., our guest, Gojo and Golick on the DraftKings Network, available where you download podcasts, 7 to 9, live uh, central time on social media as well. Mike, when you look at the tackle position, who's next for you after Joe Ald? Because Olu Fashionu is kind of that guy, and it feels like I'm reading a lot more J.C. Latham and Tale Fuaga over the last few weeks. Yeah, I would still go Olu. I just think he, he's such a uniquely explosive athlete. His lower half is, is insane to watch the power that he can generate here. I know some people are going to get scared off. He had a tough game against JT Tuamalo at Ohio State, who's going to be a future first-round draft pick and pass rusher. And, and some things may popped up this, this season, but he's a guy that if you're a team that got – and I think this is why it's interesting for Tennessee in terms of their choice. I had this conversation with someone on Twitter. Because you've got Brian Callahan, who's one of the known commodities at offensive line coach now over on this team, I think now all of a sudden the way – or sorry, Bill Callahan. When you look at that, 
you've got a different capability than everybody. You can develop a player like that. And his ceiling, I think, could be higher than Joe's, quite honestly, given the physical ability that he has there. So he'd be the next guy off the board. But you mentioned Talisi Fuaga out of Oregon State. Might have been my favorite player I watched in the lead up to this draft. A true blue road grader. I think you can flex him down to guard if you're a team, and he might even be better off. He's a little bit like turning a barge sometime. But in general, really good turn, change of direction. Absolutely. Defenders feel him when he's coming off the line of scrimmage. He has been as consistent as anyone at driving guys off the ball, moving a man from point A to point B. And so I think I would go alt. I would go for a fashion new after that. And then I would probably have Talisa Fuaga as my next guy up there in terms of the offensive lineman that had that tackle capability. Mike, there's a fascinating prospect on the offensive line from right here in Williamson County, just south of us in Nashville, in Graham Barton at Duke. Uh, who played his high school ball right down the road here at Ravenwood High School. Um, I even saw a comparison to Peter Skaronsky, uh for him this morning. It feels like a lot of people kind of split on what he is at the next level. What do you see in him? I, I think, and I saw him snapping at his pro day yesterday. I think center would be a great spot for him. And, and I think we've seen around the league, I mean, Ramon played next to one of the best examples of this. You know, we know Jason Kelsey just retired one of the more athletic senators, but I always think of Marquise and Mike Pouncey as guys that when I was coming up were sort of that profile for the extremely athletic, bit taller centers that you saw in the NFL. And if you put a guy like Graham in there with his athletic ability, I think he's got great core strength. His lower half keeps him engaged in a lot of these pass rushes and gets him out of trouble. I mean, he was playing left tackle in the ACC against some pretty quality pass rushers in the guys you saw at Clemson, the guys you saw at Florida State. And so I, I look at what he was able to do on the edge where athletically he was probably a little bit overmatched and really think he's going to be a guy that's a compelling prospect once you bump him down further along into the offensive line. So I really, really liked his game, really enjoyed watching him in the lead up as well. Mike Goley Jr. with us this morning. Mike, you brought up something as it pertains to uh, Tali Fuaga is – Hey, he's a role grader at right tackle, but you wouldn't you, you wouldn't be opposed to kicking him down to guard. I've said that stuff about college tackle sometime going to the NFL. You're probably a better guard than you are a tackle. Why do you feel that way about certain guys, and why is that a thing to you when you mention guys like him and that's something that Peter Skaronsky did last year? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's just what's asked of you at, at both spots can be so different at times, and – you know, I remember even for a guy, you know, Zach Mart was my teammate in college in Notre Dame. And I remember first couple of years out in the league, he was one of the guys that got bumped down to guard. Obviously, things have gone very well for Zach. And I remember talking about him at one point early on when we were back on campus. And he mentioned, he's like, oh, yeah, it's way better than having to deal with the mutants that they have in the NFL out of the perimeter. He's like, I'll let Tyron Smith and those guys handle a lot of that. And, and so I think what you need in terms of that lower body power to be able to push to a spot and get and cut off these high-level, incredibly athletic tweener defenders that used to not have a space in the NFL and now have become these designated pass rushers that provide such an athletic mismatch. I think the athletic capabilities that you need, not only speed that everyone thinks of, but it's that lower body power. It's that ability to get out there and be able to sustain when a guy converts speed to power, when you get Miles Garrett trying to bend around the perimeter. And so I just think, you know, sometimes we get a little bit too bogged down with the athletic profile on certain guys, but tackles one of those spots where I do think hey some guys have the game that can help mitigate that and certainly maximize their ability but in general you're always looking for those high-end explosive athletes out there because you got to contend with some of the biggest freaks on the planet no doubt I saw you were very much in tune to Wildcat watch too man the Kentucky watch you were following one of their blog sites for a while as they was trying to update what was going to happen with Calipari what is the, the, your take on Kentucky's basketball as you are very much entertained with one of their bloggers recently this week Oh, man, yeah. Listening listening to, like, local sports talk caller radio when things are going poorly for a college sports team is one of the most unique drugs and potent drugs on planet Earth. I couldn't get enough of it, and it, it seems pretty sick because it is. We've all been sad sports fans at different times, and so to get to hear how different people can be so creative in that pain and, and really address the interesting problem, like, obviously – in 2024, talking about buyouts seems silly because we just saw Texas A&M spend $75 million to tell Jimbo to go down the road and had like two donors sign that check. Calipari's buyout being what, like $33, $35 million, especially at a place like Kentucky that values basketball as much as it does, doesn't seem prohibitive to me to making a move, but it is that unique problem of 
Head Cal still gets a ton of talent in here. I mean, they've got in the last five years, I think, they've never been out of the top five in recruiting classes. This last year was the number one recruiting class in the sport, and the guy was able to make so much work for so long. I, I understand from a pure basketball sense why you would keep John Calipari at this point. I think so much of it, and the sentiment that I got listening to Kentucky fans, listening to people around the Kentucky beat is, it really is just a strained relationship between Cal and the fans. It's someone as a coach that's heard a lot of the noise about him in the fan base, that's become frustrated after a decade of incredible top-end success that's included a national championship, but not as much lately up to the Kentucky standard, and a fan base who doesn't feel like at times the coach appreciates them in the ways that they want. So I don't know if there's a way to repair that in this offseason or if we're going to walk into 2024-2025's college basketball season with his chair steaming hot each and every week like it felt this year. Food and football with a side of message boards with Mike Golick Jr., Gojo and <laughs> Golick, wherever you download podcasts, 7 to 9 of the DraftKings Network. Mike, uh, you always make us smarter and you always make us laugh. We appreciate it. Always a great time, guys. I'm going to go spam McDonald's DMs telling them to put <laughs> those Krispy Kremes inside the McFlurry. You've changed my mind. <laughs> yeah, that's hey, me, hey just, just let me know when the check's in the mail, Mike. You just, <laughs> I, I will DM you the address, bud. Well, I got you. Thanks, fellas. <laughs> Love it, Mike. Thanks, Mike Golick Jr. with us this morning. <laughs> I'm telling you, a donut-infused McFlurry. Yeah. That, that, was, that was top tier. Nothing else I need to say. That was top tier right there. You throw that thing in that flurry machine? Goodness. See, I, I'm I'm smart in where I present these ideas because Mike is powerful enough to get the ear of someone, to get the ear of one Ronald McDonald. I am not powerful enough to get Ronald's ears, but uh, but Mike Mike might be able to get one of those ears. Uh, we, the gift cards should at least be pan, passed out yeah. if he gets it. 615-737-1045. Final call for phone calls. We'll take a look at our polls of the morning. God, I feel like Buck. Wow, mm-hmm. I just teased polls at the end of the show. <laughs> Next thing I know, Robert's going to be figuring out ways to prank me. Uh, we'll get a little uh, <laughs> We'll get a little Turn Tennessee. my mic off. <laughs> we'll get a Tennessee Creighton pick from, uh, from all of us coming up. It's Ramon Foster for Wesley Mortgage here, man. I'm going to give you all the website right now, like I always do. Right now, and I'm going to give it to you later. It's whywesley.com, okay? And there's so many reasons why you need to go to that website, starting with the owner, Chuck McDowell. You hear him on our station. If you met him, you know the voice, you know who he is, and you understand his love for Nashville and the Nashville area, man. That's because he's a native. He cares about the community and proud to serve it. And Chuck reinvests in the people and the places that make Nashville suck such a wonderful place. While other mortgage companies are downsizing, guess what Chuck McDowell and the Wesley Mortgage team are doing? They're rapidly expanding in Nashville, keeping people working in the careers that they love, too. And they will love to have you join them. Chuck and his leadership team at Wesley Mortgage have a support system in place to help you succeed in the mortgage business, ensuring your loans close on time, making you making sure you get paid, giving back the time that you had to build your business and also bring the fun of the mortgage professional with their unique networking opportunities with the Tennessee Titans and the music city grand prix. They make closing deals and building relationships fun. All right. Simply go to Wesley.com for a meeting and to set it up to work with Wesley mortgage again. Why Wesley.com.
Ramp it up the week. Connor Bone, Kayla, and Will RKW brewed by Eighth and Roast. Ramon Foster, Robert Walsh, Will Bowling with you. The Buck Rising Show takes over in just a few minutes. Fun week. Fun week, man. Uh, coming up Monday, we'll have some more draft discussion. We will be within draft month when we talk to you next. It will be a, it will be the first of the month as well. First of the month. It will be first of we'll the month. We'll have uh, Andrew Catalan of CBS, who is on the call tonight at about 9.30 or 10 ish for Tennessee and Creighton. Let's go to the phones though, where Mark is in the borough. What's up, Mark? Hey y'all. I'm at the gym, so sorry if I'm a little loud. Uh but good Friday, good Friday. Question, um how why is everybody thinking how is gonna be replaced in the first in the uh second pick? Like um I I thought he did pretty good last year. And they had a thousand yard receiver. It seemed like they just need another receiver or offensive lineman. Um, uh, listen, I'm, I'm at the gym as well. Where do you guys think he was at? <laughs> he said the gym. Oh, okay. Picking oh, yeah, stuff up and putting gym. it down. What we'll did he it. ask? What, uh, Jaden Daniels, or they think why why is Washington going to take a quarterback? He th- thought they played pretty well oh, last year. I don't know if he's aware that Sam Howell was traded to Seattle. Yeah. Uh, currently, I I don't know who a quarterback. Can anyone name a quarterback on the Commanders roster right now? Cannot. Don't um, even want to attempt to. Oh gosh. Um. And they those, they added one in free agency, didn't they? They did. Because uh, Easton Stick went back to L.A. He did. Because I think there was some interest there. Uh, not Jimmy G. There are two quarterbacks on the roster. On one the Washington roster. One former Titan. The other former Georgia player. Jake Fromm. Correct. He is the backup right now. And Thank you. former Titan. Uh, form- former Titan. He was a very high draft pick. Marcus. Yes, sir. Oh yeah, right. Because yeah. that that video of him with the gray hair. With the gray hair, where um, I think V Love. Said uh, on Twitter, said that he he'd aged in presidential years <laughs> since he left Tennessee. That's I, a good point. I, another thing too, to our caller has just called is yeah, they had a thousand yard receiver too, but Washington was also cheeks. Okay, they couldn't block anything, and playing from behind also plays into a point of stat padding your stats a little bit. You always got to look at that with more context. When bad teams have high passing efficiency, is it's probably because they was playing from behind most part. They're making negative headlines like corduroy pillows. <laughs> Six new starters on offense brought in on free agency before the draft even gets here. Two of those on the offensive line have not re-signed their left tackle, Charles Leno Jr., who at hmm. one time was a really good left tackle, but age catches up to everybody. And yeah. he's about to have a hip surgery, I think. Oh, look at you with the yeah, inside knowledge. Absolutely. I had not read that. No, it was out there. Okay, it was heck out yeah. There. yeah. Chris in Nashville next on the phones. What's up, Chris? Hey guys, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, uh, just I, I got a question of uh, aside from Houston being probably number one uh, pre-draft, how would you guys rank the uh, other three teams in the order? And then if the Titans were to uh, get an A plus draft class, how would that change in uh, you guys' rankings uh, after the draft? And I'll hang up. Thanks, Chris. Nice. The, the challenge with grading draft classes right after they are picked is that there's really no way to know. Because players that we like in the draft process can sometimes end up being busts and grades that we would give drafts on May the 1st, uh, you know, grades we would give a D or a C might end up being A's. Uh, I like grading draft classes two years after you have drafted them. However, that being said, I think the Titans could be right there with the Colts at third in the AFC South going into the season if they address their needs the way they want to. As far as preseason rankings for the I think it's South? overwhelmingly Houston one. I think it's pretty comfortably Jacksonville two. And I think the Titans are trying to get on Indy's level as the third best team in the division. I think you also get the unknown aspect of Brian Callahan calling plays too. I think in his first year of him being a head coach with the teams that you're going to play two times a year, you may end up splitting games or either getting, two, getting a, a team or two, two times. I, I can't say who's going to dominate this division. As far as the FC South goes, it's expected that Houston does. But can they follow it up? The thing they got working for them is this. They kept everything the same. The coach stayed. As far as offensive coordinator, the head coach is there. You know what he's capable of. And then you expect the second-year growth. I'm expecting that same second-year growth from a Will Levis. So if we're comparing one to the other, I'd almost – I don't trust Jacksonville. 
I just don't. Which I, of those teams of those three is most likely to have a disappointing season? Is it them? Them to me. Jacksonville? Jacksonville to me. Yeah. I don't know. I think I think it did shock them, the Calvin Ridley signing and him not choosing to go back there. I don't know where and how they're going to adjust because he was one of their X factors. And they got other players, of course. But what is, uh, what's his name as, as far as his his uh, play been? Uh, the wide receiver, not Scary Terry, but um, for who? Christian Kirk. Oh, yeah. What has his play been like? If, if you don't have. You don't have Calvin Ridley. Right. Yeah. They got Zay Jones. They do got Zay Jones. And they did go get Gabriel. Well, Gabriel, so what? What was he in Buffalo after that right. that playoff run? Right. Uh, who you got tonight, Tennessee or Creighton? I'm not judging with my with my heart. I'm being real. Um, I got the balls. <laughs> I thought you were gonna. I thought you were gonna come back with like uh, I'll, I'll I'll go with Creighton. Like I'm not gonna judge with my heart, so I'll, I'll go with them. Why Why do you have Tennessee tonight? I think the defense will travel, and I think the the shot making will be there from where it wasn't in Texas. Just period. Fair. The teams, if, if we're looking at Providence and what they did, I think Tennessee can go tit for tat like they have, and I think you also have the ability to cause more turnovers. I'm going to go Creighton. I think Tennessee's season ends tonight. I think Creighton makes enough open shots, and Tennessee misses enough open shots, and that ultimately is the difference. Nothing will surprise me in this game. Genuinely not a single outcome. Tennessee could blow out Creighton, and it would not surprise me at all because if Creighton misses all those threes that they try, Tennessee will win by 15. If Tennessee can't defend those threes, I think Tennessee could lose by 15. Creighton is a very, very good basketball team. They are balanced. They are good offensively. They have a seven foot one center who averages three blocks per game. He's the Big East Defensive Player of the Year. When things are hard to come by at the rim for Tennessee, they struggle. I think Tennessee has an offensive struggle tonight. I think ultimately Creighton uh, edges out the Vols, but obviously I would not be surprised with anything. So, On the way out, which Vols player, if they're going to win, which Vols player has to have the big night? Who has to have the Who big night? Who has to have a big night for the Vols to win? Dalton. I'm going to say Zakai Ziegler. Creighton wants you to take a lot of threes. They uh, will play that drop coverage on the pick and rolls and put Kalkbrenner right in front of the rim. Sakai's got to either make a floater from 15 over his outstretched hand or make the right pass to Jonas Adu or Dalton Connect open for a shot on those uh, pick and rolls. I'm going to be honest with you guys. This doesn't feel right. I can't I can't bring us out to this. We need a little more energy today. Well, you got for us. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Tennessee and Creighton tonight go, for a Bert. spot in Tennessee's second ever Elite Eight late tonight. Put on a pot of coffee. Listen to the zone. Vol Network coverage right here on the station, we've got all Sweet 16 coverage as well, presented by our good friends at Old South Properties and uh, all of our other partners. Ramon Foster sent us home. Y'all must remember at all times, man, your Twitter fingers and your mic is always hot. Hey, it's Kayla Anderson for the Wang Vision Institute. Uh, looking to get your eyes checked. Maybe it's been a minute or so. This is the place to go. Doctors are incredible here. They'll get you on the right track when it comes to your eye care. They also will get you on the right track when it comes to uh, your skin. Maybe making it look a little nicer this summer.